Well, again, good morning. Welcome to Central Baptist Paragold Campus online, and we're so thankful that you are tuned in right now watching, and uh, they're in your family, they're in your living room, dining room, wherever you are. So glad that you are leaning into this moment with us as we are in week two of Kinfolk, which I said last week is a very southern way of saying family. And so we are in a family series right now and and believe that it is incredibly timely. We didn't plan for this necessarily in the midst of the pandemic, but we think this is incredibly timely to be in a family series right now because for the large majority, majority of us, you are and have been confined to your family alone or maybe just a small pocket of people outside of that. And what has happened in a lot of families and in a lot of marriages and between spouses potentially, between children, between uh, a mom and a dad, or excuse me, a, a mom and a child, or a dad and a child, has been a lot of points of tension. Matter of fact, if we're just being totally honest right out of the gate and super transparent, some of the marriages uh, that are watching right now, you are on the brink of disaster. You have been contemplating, whether privately or now, been dialoguing publicly about you divorcing from each other because this pandemic has caused more stress outside your home, but it has caused even more stress inside your home. There's been some dynamics between parents and children that were tense before, but now are a complete eruption of emotion and bitterness and, uh, to be honest, hatred and anger at times. Our families are in a very unique spot, and some families are thriving and growing, and some families, this whole pandemic has really revealed a pandemic that has been going on within their own souls, within their own homes. And so this series is so important. And you may be a part of a family right now. uh, They're together. You may not be. You may be entering into a season where you're about to be married or you're uh, uh, about to start dating maybe. And so this family series, you may be like, well, I don't don't need to tune into this. But hey, this is just as much for us presently as it can be for many people in the future. And so I want to invite you this morning to turn with me to to Deuteronomy 6. And we're going to look at a very famous and a very important passage of Scripture from God's Word about the family. And as you're turning there or maybe scrolling there, I, I want to share with you a quick moment I had with my daughter just a few days ago. See, like many of you, I've had time to reflect on my life and, and kind of think about, you know, I, I've, I've slowed down a little bit, and so it's given me that opportunity to think and a process, and, and to kind of weed out some things that I'm like, man, I thought this was so important, and now that all of this has happened, I've realized, hey, it's really not that important that I do that, or that I make sure that I accomplish this or that, and so I've been thinking a lot about my life, I've been thinking a lot about my, my purpose, and so I asked my, my six-year-old daughter, I said, hey, baby, what do you think is your daddy's life purpose? Matter of fact, I asked my four-year-old first, I said, son, what, is, what do you think my life's purpose is? And he looked at me and he said, um, what does that mean? <laughs> and I thought, okay, this may not be, a, this may be a little too deep for my four-year-old. But my six-year-old was there as well. And, and she said to me, after she thought for just a brief moment, here's how she replied to me. When I asked her, what is my life's purpose? And she said to me, just to be my daddy just to be my daddy. So see, my daughter, she doesn't care how many sermons I preach. She doesn't care uh, how, how big the church is that I lead. She doesn't care if I write a book. She doesn't care if I, you know, catch a, a, a 15-pound uh, largemouth bass. She doesn't care if I travel the world and see all of these things. She doesn't care if I build a business and it grows to be the most thriving business the world has ever seen. She, she doesn't care about all of those things. The only thing that she honestly cares about is that I am her daddy, that I'm there. And I love to use that word, just to be, to be my daddy. You know, sometimes our kids can bring us back to reality. Sometimes it's those who are far younger than us that bring us back to who we really are. 
And then when she said that, and in that moment, I realized, you know, because I was thinking about the things that she's seen Daddy do and the, the accomplishments that she think Dad could, could accomplish and all these different things. And what she ultimately wants is just for her dad to be her dad. That's true for all of you watching. You, you may not even have kids yet. You may be a husband or a wife, or you may be a single mom, or, or maybe a single dad, or you may be grandparents, you're retired. But the truth is, you and I cannot separate God's will from our family. And we try to a lot. We don't mean to, but we try to, to find these, these places where we can pursue and, and create excellence and, and create something and, and have success and build some type of platform and do all these things and answer all these emails. And at the end of the day, we need to realize that all of those things, while, while they're important and they have their place, at the end of our lives, at the end of our days, God's will cannot be separated from our family. And what oftentimes is happening is our families are getting the very least of us. They're getting the small amounts of energy that we have left from the day. And I, I'm here to, to tell you and to tell myself this morning that's not God's will for your family. So, so how, do we, how, do, how do we accomplish this? How, how do we put our family at the forefront of our minds and hearts? How do we live in such a way that on the day that we die, we are not thinking about emails and everything else, which we won't be. How do we get to that day and say, I have lived my life to the fullest because I've followed Jesus and I've loved my family? How do we build a godly family? Or very simply, how do we fight for our family and no longer with them? How do we just be daddy? How do we just be mama? How do we just be granddaddy or grandmama? How do we just be husband and just be wife? How do we do that? Well, we looked last week at we've got to fight for two things. We've got to fight to know God's love, and we've got to fight to show God's love. And Pastor Archie and I, we had those uh, table time is what we called it, and Tuesday and, and then Thursday night, and we kind of broke that out and what that means. We're going to do that again this week. We're going to look at this passage and get very practical in, in how we do this today. But we talked last week about God's love. You can't have a godly family without God's love. But then this week, we're going to look at this. You can't have a godly family without God's truth. You cannot have a godly family without God's truth. See, how can I be my daughter's daddy? And I've got to be present. I've got to love her. But I've also, I've got to teach and communicate to her who God is. That's my calling as her dad. And so I want to invite you this morning to 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 journey with me to an Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy 6, Moses speaking to Israelites specifically about families. And I want us to look at two very simple truths from this passage regarding God's truth. We're going to read Deuteronomy 6, and then we're going to break those out this morning. Moses is declaring this. The, the book of Deuteronomy is like Moses' final sermon to the Israelites before he dies, gives the leadership baton to Joshua, and then the Israelites, they go into the promised land. And so this is, this is Moses' kind of deathbed speech, if you will. It's a, his magnum opus, his recap of everything that God wants the Israelites to know. And he gets to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he picks up in verse 1. Here's what he says. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you. All the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Verse 3. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What a practical beautiful passage of Scripture that can apply directly to your family this morning. I want to pray for us, and then I want us to look at two very simple truths about having a godly family. It takes love. It also takes God's truth. Let's pray this morning. Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, thank you for the truth that it lays out for us. Oh God, how how lost and wandering we would be without your commands and statutes and rules and laws and ultimately the story that you laid out in scripture that ultimately points to Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, I pray this morning a supernatural miracle producing prayer that you would place in the people who are listening and the people who will listen one day to this sermon, to this message, to this passage. Father, I pray that you would place in them a zeal and a relentlessness for your word. That, God, they would seek to know your truth and they would seek to show it. Father, I pray that you would bless this moment. I pray that families right now would begin to gather up your truth and then display it to each other. And I pray all these things now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How do we have a godly family? How how do we fix maybe what has been broken in the midst of our family? Well, this morning, like I said, we're going to look at God's truth. And the first truth about God's truth is that we must fight to know God's truth. Remember me said, hey, a godly family is going to take a fight. The the tagline of this series, my family, my fight. And not fighting with them, but fighting for them. And so if you're listening this morning, you may be a student, you may be a grandparent, a single parent, a, a, a married couple with 18 kids around you. Regardless of your family situation, you need the truth of God to live out the will of God. And the first thing that you've got to fight for in regards to his truth is you've got to know it. You've got to know his truth. He, he lays out here, Moses does in Deuteronomy 6, he says, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord has commanded me, here's what he says, to teach you. So Moses is literally and has been and will continue to throughout the book of Deuteronomy, tell the Israelites who God is and what God wants. That's God's truth who he is and what he wants. And so he's saying, hey, listen, I'm laying all this out to you because God has instructed me to teach you. But there's a reason why he was to teach them so that they could know it and receive it. The ultimate uh, purpose, uh, we see this oftentimes played out. You see people who show up week to week to week to week to hear sermons and they're just listening and leaving. But the purpose is not to gain knowledge. The purpose is to know God's truth internally to believe it and to receive it yourself. And this is what Moses is saying here. He's laying this out here. And he goes on into verse 4. He gives the reasons why they should know God's truth. And then verse 4, he lays out the Shema in the Jewish tradition, very famous passage of Scripture. And he says, hear, O Israel. I love that. Sometimes we skip over that. He says, hey, hear, listen. See, I think a lot of times we, even right now, people are watching, but they're not listening. I think a lot of times when when these pews are filled back up, there's going to be people who are listening, but they're not really hearing what is being said. And so Moses says, hey, Israel, everybody, I want you to hear what I'm saying. 
Then he goes into the truth. Here's the truth of God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And I love, we're going to park there in verse 6. He says, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. Did you hear that? Not in your head, your heart. Where is God's truth in your life today? Is it in your head? Do, do, do you know a f- couple of scattered facts about God and about the Bible? Or are those things that are really embedded in your heart, do you believe them? And this is a great time to ask that question because it's in moments of stress that we reveal what we really believe. It's when the pressure is on that what is pressed out is what we actually believe. So I think there's been a lot of people who have been potentially going to church their whole lives. And then in the midst of all this, when the pressure becomes, they begin to just throw their hands up in the air and say, where's God? What is he doing? What? This is ridiculous. I'm gone. I'm anxious. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. All of these other things. What is happening is God is revealing in his love. You need to hear that. In his love, God is revealing to you, hey, you've got knowledge here, but it's not here. You're not trusting and believing and walking in my truth. You know about his truth, but you don't know his truth. And so here's the deal. I'm talking to the parents and also talking to the students in the family. I'm talking to the grandparents even in the family. If you want a godly family or if you want God to fix your family, you, whoever you are, you must know his truth. And I want to lay out, you know, we, we've, we've made this series not only uh, biblical, but also practical. We want to give you things, and that's part of the reason why we do the whole table time, Pastor Archie and I. Is we want to kind of, uh, uh, I was going to say let our hair down. We don't really have much hair to let down, but I wanted to create a moment where we kind of have a conversation with you guys, and we get super practical, and he and I just kind of go back and forth about, hey, how do you flesh this out in your home and in your family, and how have you in the past? And so I love that we do that, but I do want to get practical here and now with you. How do we know God's truth? How can we know God's truth? Well, I'm going to have a, 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 a little screen pulled up right here. You know, how can we fight to know God's truth? And I wanted to lay out these three ways, very practical. Everybody always says, man, I love hearing sermons, but, but I don't know what to do after them. These are three ways, three different modes by which God communicates his truth. And so if you're saying, hey, I want to know God's truth. I want to begin to heal my family or I want to lead my family. Or some of you young men watching and you're going to be engaged or maybe you're just dating a young woman right now. And you're asking the question, how can I become the man that she needs me to be one day? Or, or maybe a young lady, how can I become, who doesn't even, who's not even dating somebody, how can I become the wife that God wants me to be one day, the mom that God wants me to be, the woman right now that God wants me to be? Well, it's knowing His truth. And we can know His truth primarily through three different means. And the first is this, His commands. His commands, that's another way of me saying the scriptures, God's word, his Bible. And, and this uh, Tuesday, Pastor Archie and I are going to talk about that, how we spend time in God's word. We did last Tuesday. We're going to do, do it again this Tuesday. But if you want a godly family and if you want to know God's truth, you have to be a person who spends time with what he has said. I kind of wrote this little tagline out beside it. Who he is is revealed in what he said. He has declared his truth here in his word. And he desires that we know that. That's why he gave it to us. And by the way, sometimes when we hear commands, we often think of this negative idea like, oh, God is restricting us. But let me ask you something, especially if you're a parent. If you command your child not to stick a coin or a a fork maybe into a light socket or into something that is plugged in, are you being harsh or critical or judgmental? No, you're doing that because you love them. You are commanding something and it is motivated by protection, which ultimately has its foundation in what? Love. Listen, God has laid out in his word commands that he wants us to live by. Matter of fact, some of the commands that he, I read this morning, one of the commands that he, he lays out in his word is to delight in him. Hey, Blake, delight in me. 
Psalm 37. And so, listen, if you want to fight to know God's truth, you must spend time with God's commands. Second, you must spend time in God's creation. And you guys know I talk about this a lot. But man, we see God's truth in his creation. I wrote this again, this kind of line with that. Who he is is revealed in what he made. Man, we see God's design and his power when we look at a mountain range. I know if, you, if you're in the northeast Arkansas area, you probably saw this double rainbow across the sky uh, a few days ago. Man, God displays his beauty and his creation and his faithfulness through the rainbow that we read about in Genesis. God displays his intricacy and his detail in the patterns laid out in the human eye or on a flower. We see see God's goodness. We see his power and his permission when he tells the waters of the ocean, this is as far as you can go. We see his imagination when we look up into the sky. We see his his power and his majesty displayed when we walk outside and we look at the stars at night and we think we are so small. Romans 1, Paul tells us that we see God. God is evident to us, and he alludes not only through Christ, which we're going to talk about, but he also talks about through creation. God reveals who he is by what he made. And then the third way that we can know God's truth is ultimately through Christ, because who he is is revealed in who he gave. It's revealed in what he said, his word. His truth is revealed in what he made, creation. And his truth is ultimately revealed in who he gave, which was his son. See, some people have a very bad view of God. They think he's this police officer upstairs just keeping tallies of right and wrongs. Or or he's uh, some just judgmental force that really doesn't want anything to do with humanity, just a step back. But the truth is, when you look at Christ, you see who God is. You see that he is loving and compassionate and sacrificial, that he is a holy judge, but he is also a merciful Savior. You see that he is kind, that he is patient, that he is enduring, that he cares for people so much that he gave his son. We see God's truth ultimately in Christ himself. And so if you want to know God's truth, then you've got to spend time in his word. You've got to get out in creation and just slow down. And ultimately, you've got to fix your eyes on Christ. You know, um, there's a story that is kind of a, a living legend story in my wife's family. Uh, they went to Florida one year when my wife was younger and she was still at home. And it's her and her brother that uh, were, were there, the two kids and then their parents. They were on their way to Florida. Uh, excuse me, I think they're on their way back. And they had gone to Florida for a wedding. And so in Florida, we don't have these in Arkansas, but, but they do in Florida. And I know Texas places, the way they, they do as well. There are tolls. So you have to drive through this toll and you pay a small fee and, and you keep going. And so the uh, Schultz family is packed into this little rental car that they had, and they were driving, and they realized they were coming up to a toll. And so Mr. Jim, who's my father-in-law, he's driving the car, and he says, hey, uh, we're coming up to a toll. Can, uh, do y'all have any change? I don't have anything on me. So everybody in the family, they kind of start scrounging, kind of looking around in their pockets, and, and Miss Sue is looking through her purse, you know, trying to find some, some change, and he gets up to the toll, and he realizes that he's short, uh, that he doesn't have enough money to pay the toll. And I believe he needs 15 cents. And so he, he's kind of panicky. There's cars behind him. He's, he's, in, you know, he's in the middle of a highway or interstate. And so he's kind of saying, hey, guys, I, I need 15 cents. Look around the car. And, and I think it was Joy or, or her brother that kind of was like, Dad, we're in a rental car. We, we can't find any change. And so the pressure begins to build a little bit more, and, and Mr. Jim's voice gets a little bit louder, a little more elevated, and he, hey, I need 15 cents. Can somebody give me 15 cents? And so he's kind of all over the place, and Miss Sue is looking all over the place for 
15 cents and under seats and in between the seats. And, and he finally is there and he's just getting so frantic that he's looking at all of his family saying, I need 15 cents. I need 15 cents. Somebody find me 15 cents. And the family just, uh, just ultimately kind of just blows up in laughter. And what ends up happening is the car behind them, realizing kind of what is happening, walks up to the toll and gives the person 15 cents. And Mr. Jim and the Schultz family are able to drive away. And I remember when Joy and I were dating, they told me that story as uh, probably more animated than I just told there. And it's, it's kind of a li- living legend story among their family. I need 15 cents. You know, Mr. Jim learned a, a very valuable and very simple lesson that day. You can't give what you don't have. And you can, you know, you can yell and, and scream and, 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 you know, look all around and, and go under every kind of nook and cranny you want to. But if you don't have 15 cents, you can't give 15 cents. You know, the reason why I tell that story is because I think that's a, an honest look at a lot of the families in our, in our culture, a lot of families that are potentially watching right now. You may be like, well, what what do you mean, Blake? We're not going to Florida because we can't right now. What do you mean? You can't give what you don't have. See, I think there's a lot of dads out there saying, I I want a godly family. I I want a better family. I want a better marriage. I I want to fix my marriage. My wife and I, we don't talk. We don't communicate. But here's the deal. You can't give God's truth to her because you don't have God's truth in your heart. You know, you, you've got parents that are, that are trying to raise godly kids, and they're trying to do right, and they're trying to raise a, a Christian kids, and these kids are kind of growing up, and they're saying, hey, I want nothing to do with the church, or I want nothing to do with you, and there's so many reasons why, so I don't want to simplify it with just one simple statement, but I think for a lot of families, what the parents are communicating is, I don't have God's truth, so I can't give you God's truth. You can only give what you have. I want to ask this very simple question to you. Do you have His truth? You know, not only do you you have Scripture and do you have Bible verses, those are all important, obviously. Those are vital. But do you ultimately have Christ? Do you have Christ? See, you cannot give Christ's love. You can't give Christ's truth. You can't give forgiveness. You can't give those things if you don't have them. And I think what's happened in a lot of families is this pandemic has revealed that maybe even in the more spiritual people, they've actually realized that they don't really have as much of Jesus as they thought they did. You cannot give what you don't have. But you will always give what you do have. And so if you want to have a godly family, you have to fight to know God's truth so that you can show it. You've got to have it so that you can give it. And that leads us to point, tr- point two, truth two. So you've got to fight to know God's truth, but you've also got to fight to show God's truth. You've got to fight to show God's truth. Let's pick back up here in this passage in verse 7. Moses tells the Israelites, these commandments, these statutes, these judgments, you shall love the Lord your God, all those things that he's just said, knowing God's truth, it's important. You've got to have it internally in you. Then he turns his attention to verse 7, to the next generation. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. Matter of fact, a little bit earlier in this book, in uh, chapter Five, Moses says, you are to teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. And then he says it again, even in verse 6, your sons and your grandson. It's not about gender here as much as it is generations. See, the purpose, if you're a parent right now, the purpose of your life as a parent is to point your children to Christ. 
It's not the job of the school. It's not the job of the church. It's not the job of an app that you can download. It's not the job of even Veggie Tales or whatever Christian programming you are watching. Ultimately, the job of teaching your children who he is and what he calls us to be and do is you. You are the primary teacher in the life of your children's faith. And you may be like, well, well, I'm a grandparent now, and I, I, don't, I don't have that responsibility anymore. No, you still have an opportunity and a responsibility to not only pour into your adult children, and that may just look like you sending a text to them once a day, once a week with a passage of Scripture because you know what's going on in their life, or maybe a an encouraging quote, or just sending them a text saying, hey, I'm praying for you, I'm for you, or it's sending that to a grandchild. It's sending them an encouraging text or a passage of Scripture. You still have a Deuteronomy 6, 7 ministry in your life, regardless of your life stage. Your job, my job, is to pour our lives into the next generation. You know, sometimes we get caught up in the same thing that the disciples did. You know that moment in the New Testament where these kids started coming to Jesus, these children, and the disciples are like, no, 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 get them away, get them away. You know, we've got more important things to do. The adults are here. We've got ministry to take care of. We've got churches to run. We've got businesses to lead. And Jesus quiets all of his disciples and he says, hey, let the children come to me. See, that's still true for your family, but here's the deal. He has placed you in your family so that you can point your children to Jesus. You're literally like the bridge to point them to Christ. You are to teach your children. And some people may be watching this right now and and feeling like a guilt and a conviction. Maybe you're older and you're looking back and saying, I didn't do that, or we didn't do that. We just took them to church and that was it. We never talked about it. Or or maybe you're here now and you're watching and you're a you're a young mom. Your husband is not really spiritually connected to the family. He doesn't go to church. And so there you are and you're trying to raise your kids and you're sitting there telling yourself, I want to know the Bible. I want to know all these things, but I I I don't know how and I don't have enough Bible knowledge. And man, I, I can't do what Pastor Blake's saying because I'm just I'm just not equipped yet. I'm I'm not I'm not ready yet. And let me share something with you. Whatever stage you are, if you're feeling that way, you need to understand something. God loves you. And you are hearing this right now by the divine plan and timing of God. It is never too late to point the next generation to Jesus. It is never too late. Today can be the day that you start pointing your children. Maybe they're grown. Maybe you don't have children of your own. Maybe you've got a nephew or a niece. Pray and ask God, how can I invest in my grandson, my niece, my nephew? Some of the most spiritually impacting people in our families were people that we weren't living with at the time. They were an uncle or an aunt or a cousin or a granddad or a grandmother. But all of us have a Deuteronomy 6, 7 ministry, teaching the next generation. We are to show God's truth to them. And so he lays out something very practical that I want to hone in on as we finish this morning together. He says, listen, you need to talk about them. And so, hey, you need to teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them. Did you catch that word? Not lay out sermons, Not give a systematic theology lesson every night with your family, which those are fine. But he literally says to the Israelites and still to us today, hey, guys, parents, just talk with your kids about God. Talk with them. Teach them, but also talk with them. And and he says, he gives four places that that needs to happen. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, And when you rise, and then he tells them you need to bind them on your wrists and place them on these little hats that the Jewish people would wear with Scripture all around it. And he says, put it on your doorpost and put it on your gates. So he's laying out all of these places where you can be reminded. We talked about that last week about God's truth. 
But he also gives you opportunities, gives us opportunities to teach when to teach. And I want to lay out the second slide for us right here. So first we looked at like, how can we know God's truth through obviously his commands, creation, and Christ. But how can we fight to show God's truth? So, so how can we take this passage and really live that out in our family? Well, I think he lays out four different times. And uh, multiple ministries have kind of coined different phrases with this. I may have picked some of these off from different churches. And I kind of just try to keep it as alliterated as possible because y'all know me. That's how my mind thinks. But how do we fight to show God's truth? He lays out four different moments, right? When you are sitting in the house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you are laying down, and when you are rising for the morning. And so I kind of laid those down. That's sitting in the house, dinner time. Most people, especially right now at dinner time, or it was funny, we can get a conversation going. How many of y'all call that supper? Some people call it supper, some people call it dinner, whatever. It's just kind of funny. We, we have a running debate with some of our friends. We call it dinner at our house like the rest of the world, but there are some friends that call it supper. I'm just kidding. I love y'all. But we got dinner time. We've got drive time on the way as you walk by the way. It may be on a walk, but it also could be driving. Three, bedtime, and, and four, breakfast time. And so I, kind of, I want to leave this up here, guys, if we can. And I want to talk about these things because I think that if Moses were to write this to us now, so if he were to kind of bring this passage back to us right now, I think what would happen or what he would see is, hey, guys, listen, and this is so important. I think he would say, hey, at dinner time, put your phone down and talk with each other. Don't text other people. Don't stream YouTube. But at dinner time, put your phone down. Hey, at, when you're driving, Obviously, don't text and drive or call and drive, but don't put a screen in front of your kid. Why don't you talk to them about what God is teaching you or ask them questions about what God has created? I think he would say, hey, at bedtime, don't put a screen in front of your kid or TV in front of them, or you just be watching TV aimlessly while your kids are going off to bed and it's just a, hey, good night, see you later, love you, while you're zoned out vegging some Netflix series or the news or whatever you're watching. I think he would tell us, hey, at bedtime, turn off the screens and engage with each other. I think he would say at breakfast time, don't be looking through your phone. Don't wake up in the morning and start looking at your screens. Here's what I think Moses would say very simply. Put your phone down and focus on your home. I want to make this statement that I think is so timely for our culture, especially right now. I believe that many people, many parents, are showing their families that their phone is more important than their home. I'm going to say that again. I think there's a lot of adults, a lot of parents that are communicating to their children, not intentionally, not meaning to, but they're communicating that their phone is more important than their home. So here's what's happening. We have a generation that's already here. It's the millennials and then it's Gen Z after them. We have two generations now of young people who believe that technology is more vital than theology. Did you hear that? We have a generation of people who believe that I need to get my identity, my worth, my pleasure, my fun, my, my activity from technology and not from theology. Because we've had parents who have said that their phone is more important than their home. Hey, listen, I think phones are vital. I think they're incredibly important for us. And I think Christ is going to use technology to advance his kingdom. But you have to have technology as well as theology to impact the next generation. And I think what has happened with these students and also these adults, my age adults and even older, up to grandparents even, here's what I believe has happened. This is, the, the, I believe, the hardest statement to swallow of all these statements in regards to our phones, and our families. I believe that many people now, their phone is their home. Their phone is their home. It's the place that they go to for encouragement. It's the place they go to to find some type of rest. It's the place that they go to find 
pleasure. It's the place that they go to find entertainment. It's the place that they go to learn. It's the place that they go to form and shape their identity. The phone was never intended to be the home. But I think you've got a lot of young people, a lot of people my age, a lot of people older, who their phone is their home. And so I want to talk really briefly about what Joy and I do in in, in those four areas. And we're going to talk more about this on Thursday. So please tune in to Thursday when we talk about showing God's truth. But I just want to really briefly, in regards to practicality, what we do at dinner time, what we do at drive time, what we do at night time, and we, we do in morning times. Just very briefly, at dinner time, it is a no phone zone at our table. And the reason why is, is I want to communicate to my kids, you are most important to me. Not the text I'm getting from church members, not the calls I'm getting from a buddy, not the Facebook video that some friend shot to me that wants me to watch it real quick or the YouTube documentary that just came out or something about some tiger guy. None of those things are more important to me in that moment than my family. So at dinner time, it's a no phone zone. And when we sit down, right after we start eating, we pray over the nations. We have a book and I'll show you on Thursday what that is, but we pray over every single country in the world. And then we talk and I asked my children, they're six and four. Like you may be like, well, you need to wait till your kids are adults. No, they, they answer this now. We ask one question in the middle of our dinner. And it's really our conversation piece. What were you grateful for today? What were you grateful for today? And then we read a, a book together. And, and my four-year-old son calls it the Dalmatians book. And I'm going to, again, talk about that more on Thursday. But it's actually called Foundations. It's written by Tony and Ruth Simons. I believe I said that right. My wife coached me up on how to say their name right. But they wrote this book as kind of a family devotional. And here's the truth. Let me share something with you. Here's your pastor. I've never done family devotionals with my family. Like this is year, 2020 is year one for us doing family devotionals. But it has been one of the most life life-giving and fun things we've done as a family. And so taking dinner time, as Moses said, and impacting and engaging and enjoying your family. On drive time, when we drive, this isn't drive time with Blake and Ryan. This is when you're walking or when you're traveling in your car. I don't put screens in front of my kids and I don't, you know, turn on a bunch of music and just drown out the, their deal. What we do is we have a little box and I'll bring that to of questions and my wife will read questions and we'll just answer them while we're driving or every now and then my wife and I will listen to a podcast. And by the way, let me make a quick statement about all of this. All of these things are things that we've learned, not things that we intrinsically knew. We've made probably every parenting mistake you possibly can, every family mistake uh, maybe in the book. But we've learned these things or gathered them from other people. But we talk. Or maybe we'll listen to a podcast, Joy and I will, and, um, and we'll ask our kids questions. Like, hey, she was talking about Jesus' love. What, what, did, what, did you think, what did you think she meant by that? Just simple questions. We don't let drive time be a time where we drown out everything else. And third, in regards to nighttime, and we'll share some things we do there, but uh, we memorize Scripture together. We always read. We pray. All those things are good. Those are vital for your family. And again, I'll talk more about those on Thursday. And then in the morning times, and I've shared with, this, with, with all of you before, and I'm going to invite uh, Micah back up as we close everything, but I, I, I have a place that I always have my quiet time. Remember I tell everybody, have a place have a time and have a plan. We'll have a specific place. And my place, both of my children come out of their rooms in the morning, and I always try to be in that chair reading the Word. And not like I'm staging anything. That's just where I read. But I plan my morning so that when, when I'm finishing my quiet time, they're coming out. Because the first thing that I want them to see is their dad smiling at them and laying down his Bible. I want that legacy to be built into my children. So those are four moments that you can begin to cultivate Christ-likeness in your family. You know, what often I see happens, though, is a lot of people, we, we want to know what the Bible says. We just don't want to do what the Bible says. Like, we want to know what it says. Like, we want to know what it says about the end times, and we want to know what it says about, 
you know, different ideas or if we're struggling with stress or if we're struggling with singleness or if we're struggling with some question that we can't answer from a coworker. We want to know what the Bible says, but oftentimes we don't want to do what the Bible says. We don't want to do it. We just want to know it. And the calling on families is to not just know it, Dad, not just know it, Mom, but to show it, to communicate it, to display it. I want to share with you uh, two stories. One of them is fictional and one of them is real. I want you to imagine that a, 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 fr- a friend of yours, we'll, we'll call him John. So you're using imagination this morning. John comes up to you. And John has a problem. John needs to build a a physical home. He he, he literally has to build a a board and concrete home. He's got to build a home. Got a family now. He's got to build a home. They don't have a shelter. And so you, you tell him about the complete home builder's guide. And he's like, what? I didn't know about this book. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go buy it on Amazon, and they're going to ship it to me. I'm going to get it. So John gets the book. And and you don't see John for a couple of months, and and so he comes back to you, and and, uh, you ask him, hey, how has the the home building guide, how how has reading through that gone? How how has that whole process been? And, And John looks at you and says, I love this book. Matter of fact, listen to this. I've started memorizing different parts of the book. I've read a lot of the sections of the book. And check this out. I've even got a group of guys that I meet with every single week. And we bring our books and and we talk about what we've learned about building homes in that book. And and we, we memorize verse, we memorize parts of the book and and we hold each other accountable to making sure we know those sections and I know the the stories and I've I've read through all the examples of homes that we're supposed to build or able to build. We're like, man, that's great. And you just assume in your head, okay, well he's probably already built a home now. He's probably already physically built his home. And so one day you're driving down the road and you see John's wife and John's three kids, and they're, they're on the side of the road. And, and you pull up beside them, and, and you look at them, and you say, Hey, uh, <laughs> what are y'all doing? Y'all need a ride? Are you okay? And, and one of John's children looks at you and says, we, we don't have anywhere to go. And you're confused. You know, you're like, well, Hold on, you, you, your dad's got the book. You're, you're, you're fine. He knows how to build you a home. You've got a place to go. And that one of the children looks at you, another one of the children looks at you and says, yeah, my dad was so consumed with talking about the book that he never actually built us a home. He he was so caught up in the book that he never built us a home. And so now we're homeless. You know, why do I I tell that, that story? Because I believe, and it's a fictional story, obviously, but I believe that has described and continues to describe many families in the American church. You got a dad or a mom or somebody. They were all about the book. You know, they memorized it and had groups that circled around and talked about the book and they studied the book. But the problem was they never built what the book told them to build. That They never did what the book told them to do. I think there's a lot of families in our churches they know a lot about the book. They know a lot about the truth. They're just not showing it. We want to know it. We just don't want to do it. What about you? Is that you? or Are you, are you John in that story? I want to tell you a real story now. A short story. 
about a young man. It's about a young man who was raised by an imperfect family. And this family was made up of a single mom and a grandmother. And this single mom and this grandmother, they were followers of Jesus. They, they really, truly trusted and followed Christ. And we're perfect. And we're in a perfect family. More than likely had brokenness, had hurt, had pain of, of death. But this young mama and this grandmother, they raised this young boy to follow Jesus, to trust in Jesus. They taught him and they talked with him. I'm sure they sat around dinner tables and while they were walking places and when he went to bed and when he woke up, they were trying hard, prayerfully to set the example for him, knowing God's truth and then showing God's truth to their son and grandson. And that young man has a solid foundation from his family and he meets another guy named Paul. And Paul sees something in this young man and he invites him to come with him on his missionary journeys and he follows Paul as a young, timid man and ultimately God calls this young man to ministry and he is placed at one of the first churches that the world has known in Ephesus. And he pastors there faithfully for the rest of his life, history tells us. That young man was, was Timothy. He got a, had a book written to him. A letter of Timothy from Paul. And you know what Paul says there at the very beginning of this letter? He reminds Timothy that his faith, it started because of a faithful single mom and a faithful grandmother. Hey, listen, God uses imperfect or maybe, maybe from the world's perspective, incomplete families to complete His family. God uses imperfect families to accomplish His perfect will. I want to share that with you this morning. For those of you who feel hopeless or feel like you've, you've made too many mistakes, it's not too late to know God's truth and show God's truth. There's no amount of information possible to know the impact Timothy had on the world for the gospel. There's no way of knowing this side of heaven what type of impact that young man had. But I know where it started. Two ladies, two women who loved Jesus, who knew His truth and taught His truth. So this morning, I want to invite you in on this journey know His truth and to show it to your family. And so this morning, some of you need to give your lives to Christ. You're like, hey, I, I don't know God's truth because I don't know God. I know about Him, but I don't know Him. And this morning, your response needs to simply be realizing that you've sinned against Christ, but realizing that He loves you, that He died on the cross, to pay for your sins in His love and His grace and His mercy was tortured for your release from sin. He was buried after His death and He resurrected to defeat the death that you and I will all one day face. See, death won't be my end. Death will be my beginning because of Christ. He did that for you, but now He's calling you 
to know him, to follow him, to become a part of his family. And the way that you do that is that you repent and you believe in the gospel. You call out to him and you say, Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you. And I want you to save me. I believe in your death, your burial, and your resurrection. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I repent of my sins. I want to follow you. Lord Jesus, save me. And if you pray that to Christ in faith, he'll save you. And the beginning of you having a godly family will start today when you find God in Christ by calling out to Him. And those of you who are here who are watching, who, who know Christ, you're, you're a follower of Jesus. Man, praise God for that. What are you teaching your children? What are you doing to prepare yourself for a future spouse or maybe future children? How are you impacting your grandchildren? What are you doing at dinner time when you're driving, at breakfast and at bedtime? Will you join God in what He wants to do in your family? Or will He do it without you? Hey, join Him on this adventure to fight for your family. It's your family. And it's your fight. I love you guys. We miss y'all. We can't wait to see y'all. I'm going to pray for us. And then you make sure... You tune in next week. Watch on Tuesday and Thursday. Those devos as we unpack this passage a little bit more. And make sure that you, if you're able, to give towards uh, us being able as a church to bless other people with $20 in free gas. Just communicating very simply, Jesus loves you. Hey, let's pray this morning. Father, thank you so much for the means, the opportunity for us to, to do this right now. And Father, I pray that you would continue to advance your kingdom through this church and Father, through our families. Father, I pray that you would do a powerful and eternal work in the lives of families. I I pray that they would begin and seek towards, be rejuvenated, be fired up and excited again, motivated by your love and grace and mercy to know your truth and then to teach it, to show it to the next generation. Father, do immeasurably more in the lives of families. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So good to see you guys again Tuesday and Thursday. Make sure you tune in, and if you want to give towards the gas fund, cash right when you show up, a check to the office, or also you can give online and designate that. Pastor Brett's going to have more about that this week. We love y'all. We miss you. We can't wait to see you. God bless your family. See you next week.